I don't think that science is always going to be for the good. I don't think that technology is always progress. And actually, governments, institutions like the firm rise and fall. And our ability to see our society in failure mode and collapse mode, I think, is very, very new. But I think it's a very mature view. And if you look at, um, if you look back at history, you probably would have adopted that view earlier. And I think it has three consequences for us as individuals. I think that we as individuals are evolving a much stronger sense that we're in charge of our destiny, that we have to become more self-reliant and self-dependent. I think also you see more and more, and I, I tend to research these things through analyzing large data sets on the web, so what kind of opinions are evolving on the web. You see a lot of people actually using the recession to improve their lives. And I find that really phenomenal. There's, there's no huge um, psychological damage being caused by the recession like, it, like happened in 1973 or 1982. You, you're not seeing it on the streets. So I think we're looking to improve. And finally, I think there is a kind of new mutualism. So, so this kind of personal innovation lifestyle that we've, we're adopting has consequences for the things we do together. And to give some examples, Amanda Hocking sells 100,000 e-books a month. She's a 26-year-old writer who to date hasn't written for a conventional publisher. She's just decided that she'll use e-publishing and that she's just phenomenally successful, one of the most successful authors out there. And I think of that as th this new self-dependency. People want to go out and do it for themselves. They don't want to rely on the institutional processes. Now, you, you could say, OK, because you've got the Kindle and you've got the iPad, e-publishing is now possible, and it's not really to do with technology, uh, Amanda, it's to do with technology, but actually the technology's been around a while. This year there will be one million e-books published, so one million people have decided that they are authors, they're creative enough to get their message out to the world at large. And I think, again, when you start to, th when you start to acknowledge that individuals are empowered in this way and look around you, something like the web strikes you as perhaps the most powerful uh, incarnation of that. So in the case of the web, just created by a bunch of guys. It wasn't created by Microsoft or Ericsson or Nokia or no large corporation, but a bunch of people that needed to communicate images more effectively. They put together the bones of what became the web. Um, perhaps the most powerful invention of the last 20 years, if you think of it as an invention. And you see that also in sports. So things like that, the whole boarding uh, phenomenon is, is a sports, uh, you know, user-based um, innovation. Uh, the quote here, I, I'll read it out because I know people at the back might not be able to see it. Eric Van Hippel from MIT studied the, the British economy and he studied the role of the individual in creativity and innovation. And what he found was that the amount of money individual consumers spend making and improving products is more than twice as large as the amount spent by all British firms combined. So again, if you start to take the individual seriously, if you're in the innovation game, this is where the action is. You know, companies are, are kind of lazy in comparison. Now, I want to briefly uh, go through those three elements I talked about earlier as well, performance improvement. I'm oh, sorry, you know, we've, we've done with you know, some kind of self-dependency, self-motivated change. But performance improvement, um, I don't know if anybody knows the, the current world record for the Rubik's Cube. So. I'll uh, ask, anybody think it's around five minutes, ten, one, six seconds? Yeah, so it's about six seconds. It's a fairly trivial example, but what drives it is people's ability to communicate online, because these um, networks of, of Rubik's Cube enthusiasts drive each other forward to improve their times. I don't think there's any, any company that knows how to harness people's desire to do things better, the kind of self-driven, self-motivated desire to improve and improve and improve things. Now, you see it in an even more trivial example, but one of my favorite examples, which is yo-yos. Uh, and in the case of the, the professional yo-yo circuit, these guys design their own. They, they have lathes in the garage, they, they shape and weight the yo-yo, and they go off and they win competitions in yo-yo routines. What's, again, interesting about it is what they do when they create these prototypes is they send them to China. The Chinese will produce four or five, and then an American company steps in. If, the guy, if this guy wins the championship, he's got a market for yo-yos. 
and an American company comes in, commercializes that, and suddenly he's got royalties for this new design. So again, there's, there's self-improvement and commercial exploitation at work. And finally, I mentioned some kind of mutuality coming out of this, and I, I tend to think of Sweden when I think of mutuality. I hope I'm right. Um, anybody heard of a Airbnb? No? Airbnb, okay, one person. Airbnb is uh, what it suggests. So it's bed and breakfast on somebody's airbed in their home. There are now more beds available through Airbnb in New York City than there are through the New York City hotel system. So in the space of three years, you've recreated, effectively, the hotel system of New York, and many other cities, by the way. In the case of Airbnb, you pay, so you know it's, it's cheaper than the hotel system. In the case of Couchsurfing, you bring your interest in the culture that you're visiting. And I guess more people will have heard of Couchsurfing. So I had my first Couchsurfer last week, week before last. And I made the mistake of not putting a limit on the number of days. So <laughs> four days later, we had to ask him to leave. So, But you know, it's great. You know, it's, it's really cultural and human. And you know, my interest in your culture gets me a free bed. And of course, landing clubs, so people are starting to lend that idea that we don't need banks, it's very, very slow to grow, but it's there. So again, I'm going to try and open things out to a discussion. And Can I um, ask you a question before you do that? Yeah. So I'm trying to understand your message on this picture. I, are you getting across the message that really growth is being driven by individuals, not companies, not countries, but individuals? Is that the main message? I think the main message is that it's a powerful source of innovation. And companies don't know how to harness it. They don't know how to harness the it from an individual perspective. So they don't know how to harness what individuals are doing. Though in this particular case, there are American companies now that do harness these types of innovation in, in what, what used to be parlor game sport. You know, parlor games, but now a sport. But I, I think equally... Um, sorry, to remind me of the question. Yeah, I think, I think it's that factor that companies don't know how to harness either the innovation or the performance improvement. And I think it is, at the same time, creating parallel, almost like a parallel economy. And I, I'm going to say it's a parallel economy and contradict myself in five minutes' time. But I think there is an emergent around personal innovation lifestyles. Then I have the, my next question, my following question to have. Is growth being driven locally or is it being driven globally? So is growth being driven locally, or is it being driven... Given what you said. Yeah, is it glo global, globally driven, or is it locally driven? You know, I think it's a whole, it's a whole bunch of things, but right now the problem is there isn't that much growth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think what we need to be thinking of is transformation being driven globally or locally. Uh, I think we underestimate how much it's being driven locally, and if you were looking for one of those book titles for... Um, uh, the New York Times bestseller list, I think the, uh, the, 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 I don't know, the re-emergence of the local would be it. You know, I think there, there are powerful forces at the local level that policymakers are not acknowledging. Um, one example of it, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Local Motors. Does that name ring a bell with anybody? Well, local Motors, at this stage, is an American, uh, an American initiative. But what they do is use open source design, so open source car design. Um, there's enough open source car component design for you to download that and create your own car tomorrow. What Local Motors does is package that and sell it as kit cars. The reason they sell it as kit cars is because they can't get a uh, roadworthiness approval for the designs. Not because it's not roadworthy, not because it's roadworthy, not roadworthy, but because they can't afford to put it through the processes that would get it all the certification that it needs. So what you, what you actually have is, a ver again, a very powerful but, but restrained um, local innovation movement around cars that could possibly, you know, it's not going to knock the price down to two grand tomorrow, but you could imagine some impetus behind radical cost reduction through local motors. Um, but a number of factors prevent it. Any other thoughts about the personal side of innovation? Yeah. 